I, I will continue. Okay. So remember, I will just write it again. I will do a better job of this thing. Okay, so pause. Don't just to uh, recall it from last time. So we said that any two distinct points of M can be separated by neighbor. <coughs> that was what I concluded with that. Okay, so continuing from there, I will call a family U alpha, so that's my family of open sets. U means open set from last time, if you remember. And alpha is just an index on the set. A family of open sets. So remember, we have our manifold, we have a bunch of points in this manifold, and it's also, so each point or distinct points can be separated by open sets. Okay. So you'll have a bunch of open sets in M. And this family of open sets, we say, forms what we call a covering. Of M, if M can be written as the union as follows. So, if I can write M as the union of my family of open sets, then we say that this family forms a covering. Of them. So all the possible open sets, it covers the number of them. And further, we say that a covering, call it R, is Finally, if U alpha contains, as you can imagine, a finite number of others. number of covering. I'm sorry, finite covering. Not a finite number of covering. We say that covering contains a finite covering. That's what I want. So that covers, uh, yes. So uh, in the family of new alpha, so yes. that every atom which is open set is, is being the uh, Yes, 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 very good. Yeah. So what I can do, instead of talking about my space M in terms of the points, I can describe it completely by these open sets. That's what this does. So you can decompose M in terms of a covering of open sets. All possible. So this covers my definition of topological space. So let me extend this now a little bit, okay? So let me talk about maps of sets. 
So maybe you saw some of this in calculus, uh, maybe not, but anyway, that's the thing. So let u and u prime be two sets. And suppose, I'm doing a lot of writing today, I just realized. And suppose that there is a map from u to u prime. So two sets, there's a mapping that goes from u to u prime. Okay. Which and what does this mapping do? It assigns uh, to each point. For lack of a better terminology, I will call this point P. To each point P in U, a unique point, P prime in U prime. So just the function. It uniquely maps one point in U to uniquely one point in U prime. So P to P prime. Okay, and we call this map as you may guess, f. That's what you typically see. So our notation would be something like f goes from u to u. And you've seen this a gazillion times. So then, based on this definition, we can say some things about f. Everybody right now is wondering what happened to the differential <laughs> But they're all dead. Okay. I promise. Okay. The nature of F can be classified as follows. Number one. So there's just three characters. So, if F is such that for every P prime in F of U, there is exactly one of P in U that maps to P prime. We say that F is what? Does anybody remember? If I if my function is not the one to the other one. One to one, very good. Or something more advanced textbooks call it what? Injection. There's one more. Which one is it? Subjective? It is just one to one. Who said? Injective. Yes, very good. Okay. I can never remember, I always have to look it up. But one to one injective means. Yeah. And further, so that's one problem. That's all the French people's fault that these terms were introduced. It's actually a Bourbaki in the 1920s. He was not satisfied with one to one and on two. So he started to like injective, surjective, like yeah, they, they really messed up math for a lot of people. Everybody was fine with limits as x goes to a, and then he decided, no, no, that's one of the best thing I did. So, yeah, the French school and the Russian school of mathematics, from that point, they had a big diversion. There's a joke, um, if you go to a Russian school uh, and ask any high school student what is 5 plus 3, they'll say 8. But if you ask a French elementary school student, they say 5 plus 3 is equal to 3 plus 5 by the associated property of yeah. I don't know, it's because they do these types of things. But it's useful, I mean, you can't do, understand these things without. Okay, another possible.
ultimately is that if f of u is equal to u prime, we say the map is now subjective on the other on two. Or on two. And the reason is that um, it simply maps u to u prime. And then finally, you can imagine, and you know this, if 1 and 2 are both true, it's 1 to 1 and on 2, then we have a bijection. Okay. So if f is both injective and subjective, we know it's bijection. So 1 to 1 and on 2. So mappings of sets. Uh, in this even general context works exactly the same way as for something, as you know. Okay, so that, I just want to introduce some of this to now. Because it'll come up. So let me now move on. And any questions? So this should just be a review, essentially. So, our background is a bit different, but um, the basic ideas are We're almost there, where we need to be. I have to do a few more things. OK, so now, a separate, I guess, heading. But I don't know what to call it. Just put a line in there. So let Rn, your famous, well-known Rn, be the set of all if I use the word and to go, does everybody know what I mean? Yeah. From your multivariate vocabulary stuff? I just mean some vector that has n elements. Python programmers would know n to go. So set of L n to go are of real numbers. That's what you really mean by R. That is <coughs> the set of all, so I will denote it like this, okay? x1 all the way to x I'm putting my label on the upper index instead of the lower one because I want to save it for later. So this is not x to the power of 1, it means x1. It's easier, you'll see later on. If you don't like it, you can switch it, but I'm used to it. So this is just my label, x1. You write it like this, but for reasons you will see, I write it on the upper. So it's just a label. So it's just coordinates, right? And suppose are just your coordinate vectors. Okay. Where each xi is just a element of R1, so it's just a number. For i equals one to okay. now I will extend what I've already introduced in combination with this. So now let M be a set of points, as I drew for you last time. But now I'm writing down. So given this, let M be a set of points. So just some set with some points. We say that M is a manifold if I will write on this. If for every point of them, what can we say if for every point of M there is an open neighborhood of that point for which there is 
a continuous one to one and on to map. Call it F to some open neighborhood of R. I'll draw this for you in a second, but intuitively try to understand. You have M, which is a bunch of points. It's a set of points. My claim is that M, or by definition, M is a manifold if around each point there's an open neighborhood that maps to an open neighborhood of R. Okay? Think of it like this. So I'll draw this for you in a second. But try to visualize what this is. And come back. Okay, and further, if this map, I'm saying it's continuous one to one and on two, so it's a bijection. And further, we assume that F inverse is continuous. So from two classes ago, when we talked about transformations of coordinates, what was the name of a function that is both bijective and has an inverse continuous mode? That's not. No, very good. It's not very good. You're, if you're paying attention. That's good to do. So indeed, we say that if we also assume that the inverse is continuous as well, so therefore it is a homing. So most of this you've not seen before, so I'm just introducing the uh, terminology. It won't show up on your exam. Don't worry. It could, maybe. No, it it's amazing to me how, um, how many people have written textbooks on differential equations, but most of them just say the same thing in a different form. At least this gives you some idea of what is really going on in ordinary differential equations. And how much very structure there is actually going on. But right now you still won't see it, but you're starting to get an idea of it. Okay. So, the point is the point. With all of these conditions satisfied, this is the most important point. So, if every single one of these things I've known is true, then what? Then, a local region of M can be made to look like R of local. That's the point. So you can start to see where I'm going with this. I can take any manifold, and within some open region, I can make it look very much like R. And that's my vector space. So I'm starting to get where I want to go. Alright. So let me build on this idea. Maybe you started to form the picture in your head a little bit. So let me make it more clear. Okay. So now consider two regions. You can consider more, but I will just consider two. And call these regions, for lack of better terminology, U and Capital U, capital U. And consider the following mapping. So one mapping, I will call F, it goes from U to Rn, motivated by these definitions. And I will consider another mapping called a G that goes from B. So two mappings. U and V are regions of M, and they map from that region to some open region of R, based on these terms. Fine. Now what? And I will also, just to be safe, I will assume that 
uh, u and v have a non-empty intersection. We talked about this last time, but I will just make it more explicit. All right. So what can I do? Maybe I should write it out first and then draw a picture of it. So I'll do that. That's a better idea. Now, I will ask you to choose some point. Call it A. In my function that takes as its argument u intersects u. So some point in this function. Which is a subset of R. And take the coordinate in that Rn to be, I will just denote this as x1 all the way to x. All right. Now, Oh, so much writing. It's okay. It's just for maybe one or two steps. Now use the inverse mapping, F inverse, to map this point A back to you in F. And in fact, back to Let's say point B in U intersection. So I'll draw this out for you. You'll see it. It's not clear. But I have to explain it first in words. So you understand the term. Because also the chances are I may draw it and then nobody will understand my drawings. Which happens a lot. Okay. And further, since B lies in this intersection, uh, we can now use our other mapping, G. We can now use G to map B, but now to some other point, call it C. in the region G U intersect where the coordinates of this region I won't denote by x1 to x10 I'll call it y1 to y where these coordinates I will denote as y1 all the way to So what have I done in doing all this complication? What I've done is the following. Um, since, well, I don't need to write it again because I've written that in already. So by the properties of F and G, we have a one-to-one -one mapping. A one-to-one -one mapping, which is actually G composed of F and G. If you actually look at what I've done, based on this information here. We're using F inverse to go back. So what I've done is construct the mapping G composed of F inverse, and that has this point. But I promise it will be clear in, in a second. Maybe it's clear. Uh, from the region uh, F U intersect V of in Rn to another region G U intersect V of What have I done? 
Can anybody see it? I'll give you a hint. I've done something. In originally, I have coordinates x1 to x, and and I have new coordinates y1 to y n. What have I basically set up here? Yes, but which coordinates of which are n to which coordinates of which are n? Anybody see it? Volunteers? I've done something here where I start off with coordinates x1 to xn, and then I get a relation that tells me how to get some new coordinates y1 to yn. I've defined a coordinate transform. This is what you mean by changing. So what we've done actually, so in this process, and I'll, I'll draw this again. In this process, we have actually defined a coordinate transformation. So in your second year calculus course or first year calculus course, when they asked you you had x and y, and you want to switch to polar coordinates, this is actually what you were doing. By defining x as r cos theta and y as r sine theta, switching from x, y to r theta, this is actually what you were doing. But this is the general reason why this works. So you can imagine this. So something like, so y1 is actually y1 of x1. So we know how to get our new coordinates in terms of the old one. So therefore, it's a coordinate transformation. Okay. Okay. So let me let me draw what I've written here in pictorial format, and hopefully it will be clear. So as I said, M is just that. It doesn't have to be a circle, it can be anything. But I will go ahead. This is M, and it's a collection of points. Consider some set U. So I'm just drawing on a picture of what I wrote in words, so hopefully you'll be clear. And some other set, call it B, and the intersection between the two is not. And as I said, call this intersection B, which is just U intersection. Fine. I said there's a mapping that goes from U to some local copy of Rm. So call this Rm. And here is F of B. So maybe I will extend this. Then, from the point B, I said maps to some other region here, called this A. And this is F of U intersection. Okay. And then from the point B, we also have a mapping G, as I denoted before, that goes to some other copy of R. And I said to call this point C. So this is G. So this should be G of B, and this should be G of B. Because that's where we're taking the map. And I said there's an inverse mapping at inverse, and similarly for this. Sorry? U, oh no, that's very bad. It's very bad. Thank you. So, ignoring all this, what am I basically doing? What I'm saying is that our manifold is very general. It contains a bunch of regions. And each region locally maps to some copy of R. That's it. That's all I'm saying. So you can make some region, so this is some point, and this is a neighborhood around that point. You can map this neighborhood of this general manifold to some locally R. And R I just mean it. So this is like R. <coughs> this is R, and so that's all I'm saying. And in this process, I've told you how to define a coordinate transformation. 
So this machinery starts to allow us to talk about vectors on more general curve space. Because you can see now, if I have some general curve space, I can make it locally look like R. So I can define my vectors now in some local region of my general space, which looks like Rm anyway. And all my work is happening in here. I actually don't need to worry about what's happening. So that's the idea. But I need to, to go a little bit more. To reduce the manifold, you are allowed to do the jumping in time. Yes, yes, yes. This is the genius of Riemann, actually, who came up with all this stuff. Uh, but, anyway. Okay. Question? Yes? So, uh, you mean, now what you're doing is you made a pretty automated transform through a manifold. But how do you make sure that you have an existing That's guaranteed by the fact that I'm considering Hausdorff. That's why I was fussy about Hausdorff. If I do not have that, then I cannot be as nice as I am. So Hausdorff, because I can separate points into neighborhoods, I can map those neighborhoods uniquely into copies of R. So that's why I was fussy about having Hausdorff. But I will make it more clear. Okay. So. There's a difference, you can always find a mapping, but you could find a really bad mapping. So there's a difference between using what we say good coordinates and using bad coordinates. So for example, transforming from x, y to r theta is an okay coordinate transformation. There's no direct singularity in that. So you, you need to have a well-defined coordinate transformation. So it could be that it's actually pretty hard to do that in general. But in most cases, you can always find one coordinate transmission that works for the vast majority of cases you're interested in. So I'm going to actually talk about it. So now that you have some idea, but if this is too confusing for you, just keep the picture in your mind that I have some general M, and I can make any local region of the M look like R. That's it. That's all you need to take away from this. If you want to be more precise, then you can use this. But the basic idea is that any local region of M can be made locally to look at R. And this is where your vectors and all these things look a little bit easier. OK, so just take that away. It takes a while. Like, you cannot possibly learn this in, this in a course. You have to read it again. So related to this, it's a very important concept of what we call an address of charge. An address of charge. And what I mean by the so charge, by definition, is a map of some open neighborhood of M to R. That's what I mean by chunk. And in this figure, you can see that F and G are both charts because they do precisely that. So now you can imagine you can have a bunch of charts for them. Because, like I said, why would I want to stop? I can have many mappings that go from any region of M to R. I just drew two here, but there's many of them. Infinite ones, maybe. So, we say that a set of charts is an atom.
if that seven chart cover all of it. If it covers. And this is very important. So let me finish this definition, then I'll ask you a puzzling question. If you're not puzzled already, let me ask you. So this is related to what you did last year. So consider two intersecting charts. Of M. One has coordinates, call it XK, where A is some label that goes up to the dimension of this. With coordinates XA, and the other one has coordinates YK. Let me define this quantity J as the determinant of the following matrix, namely partial XA with partial Y. Or other way. Determinant DYA of DX. Do you remember when you were doing volume integrals? In your multivariable calculus, uh, have you done volume integrals, surface area integrals? If you're in some weird coordinate system, you have to add a Jacobian factor. That's where this comes from. You have to account for the fact that you have some extra fudge factors to make that integral well defined. So it comes from this idea. So J is the Jacobian. So I've defined a Jacobian matrix now. This is a matrix that relates these two charts in one in coordinate xA, one coordinate y. And if you're confused, Go back to the case when you were trying to integrate something over a circle. You always have to put a Jacobian factor there, of like r squared cos theta or something. So it's exactly the same. So is it, is, it, is it a scaling? Exactly, exactly. Because you're going from essentially integrating over a square to integrating over a circle. So there's some Just weird transformation that's gone that you have to take account of. So this is what that is. Okay. Yes? I want to keep the indices different in case that you have uh, more coordinates in one case compared to the other. So I, could, I don't always have to go from the same dimension, right? I can go from R3 to R2. So, so I want to make that case. Look, and I just want to see. So if J does not change sign at all, on M, then we call M oriented. And further, you know this from your calculus book. Good, I think I will have time to ask you that question. Okay. And further, if the J factor here, which is the determinant, does not equal zero in any neighborhood of one point, of any point in M, then there is a one-to-one -one inverse, as you know, coordinate transformation in that yeah. So this answers uh, your question. It's, you have to be, when you're choosing coordinate transformation, motivated by this idea that the Jacobian should not be zero in your transform. So this is, helps you define it. Okay, so let me ask you this question now. Okay. If I, yes, I let me, as I said, a manifold can be anything you want it to be. So let me make it a sphere for you. So consider once again my three-dimensional or two-dimensional sphere. I've always wondered, is it three-dimensional or two-dimensional? Sphere? Yeah. 
Why should it be free work? Because it's because your z is a function of x plus one. So is it 2D or 3D? I don't know. I've always had this plus a well. Anyway. Because you only have two I, okay, let me get to my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> So let me denote this sphere as the set of all x, y, z. So you've seen this before, but in R3, such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. So the units, you've drawn this thing. So that's my manifold. It's this sphere. And I've written by this equation. My question is to you. How many coordinate systems or charts do I need to cover this sphere exactly? Can you find me a system of coordinates that will cover this entire sphere? And if so, how many such coordinates do I need? So remember, a chart takes an open neighborhood of my sphere to some open neighborhood of R. So my claim is that there's six of them. You need six coordinate charts six set of coordinates to cover this field. What are they? In one minute. Two, and you have three, four, and one in the middle, and I don't know the sixth one. You're very close. The very close. side? So the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, eastern, western, what about the other two? It's the same as east-west, but just rotate 90. So you have rotations around x, two rotations around y, and two rotations around z. Is that? Yes. You see that? That's what I mean. So this is a helpful way of visualizing what I mean by chart. Because you have, manifold can be anything you want it to be. So in this case, I'm considering it to be a sphere. I'm, but I need a set of coordinates. There's not one set of coordinates that you can use that will cover the entire sphere. It just cannot be. So you, you can have one for here, one for here, and then I guess one for the other direction, which I cannot do on the board. Any questions about this? Is there a rule, like if it's n is equal to 3, then it's 6? Or... Not that I know. Not that I know. Actually, 6 is the systematic way of doing it. There's one way you can do it that there's precisely two charts that will cover the entire sphere. And if you've ever opened an atlas, you know what the answer to is. It's stereographic projection. So that's the way to get to. So it's very related. It's called atlas of charts because it's supposed to make you think of the earth. So how many ways can you? There's no one way to draw a complete flat space picture of the earth. You need many types of charts to do. So an atlas has things that project the upper atmosphere, hemisphere, or southern hemisphere. That's why it's called an atlas of charts. So many coordinate charts need to cover the surface of the Earth. So I will continue. Now that we've set up this material, next on Wednesday, I will finally get to allow you to come back.